Welcome to Words of Aloha with Pastor Izzy Manzo of Amazing Grace Ministries International. We're headquartered in Kailua Kona on the Big Island of Hawaii. Join us now as we get into God's Word. Father, thanks for this morning, this beautiful day, Lord. I, I do ask you that if it be all right, we'd have a few whales jumping and... Uh, in our wallpaper today as we enjoy your handiwork around us. And Lord, we, we, we pray that as we look to your scriptures in this place that you would open up our eyes, open up our ears, and so we would see and hear the things that your Holy Spirit would want us to see, want us to hear, to grow in our faith in you and in, in our knowledge of you. And we ask that now in Jesus, in Jesus Christ, your precious Son's name. And everyone that agree with me said, Amen. Amen. Would you turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 7? We're going to continue this beautiful epistle that Paul wrote to the church at Corinth. And those of you that haven't been with us, we're just going chapter by chapter, verse by verse through this wonderful letter that Paul wrote. This is a letter that was to a church. Paul had actually been the catalyst for its, for its um, what do you say, church plant. He was... He went on his second missionary journey and spent a year and a half in Corinth and pastored the church there, founded it, saw the people introduced to Christ. It was a it was not a place what you would think of as like let's out of places to pick to go share the gospel. They'd be like today. Let's pick some spots in the United States to go on missionary journeys to and share Jesus. Where should we go? And you know <laughs> what LA? <laughs> Uh, <laughs> Kona, uh, Las Vegas, you know, um, Harlem, you know, what, what, what you pick some ghetto place or some, some place that's f Sin City. Well, in the days of Jesus and, and just after that, in the days here of Paul ministering the gospel, Corinth was the Las Vegas of the day, so to speak. It was the port city with a lot of sin and corruption, a lot of brothels, a lot of immorality and the lord sends paul to go share jesus you know in this we would say in a spiritually dark place god goes let me send my light they need that and you know sometimes this isn't popular with christians they only want to go to the light places like don't send me there lord that's a that's a spiritually dark. When, when i when i talk to other pastors about coming to hawaii 25 years ago they said don't go uh, they said, we know it, 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 this is going to sound counterintuitive, that it's such a beautiful physical place, and it, and it seems like paradise on earth, but spiritually, it's really dark. And it's hard to tell people that they need a savior when they feel like they don't need anything. They're in paradise. And you're going to find out it's not an easy place to preach the gospel. They weren't kidding. But, you know, when the Lord tells you to do something, what are you supposed to do? Do what he says, right? I don't really, I didn't actually look at it as a choice. You know, I know for some Christians, they're like, well, I choose, I pick and choose. Whatever God says, I kind of weigh it out. Do I want to? Do I not want to? I don't actually look at my relationship with God in that manner. Because I, when I got saved, I, I guess I came to read the scriptures, and every time I read the intros to like all Paul's letters, start off with, Paul, a bond slave, a bond servant of Christ Jesus. What's a bond slave? That's a one that, you know, a slave. But not a slave by, because you got yourself in debt or in trouble, but because you found a really good master. And in the days back then, if you, if you say you started off, you, you, you got yourself in trouble and you had to, to work off some, some debt, you, 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 you became an indentured servant to this guy and you, you worked however many years were required to pay off the debt. At the end of that season, if you found out, hey, I'm doing pretty good since I've been with this master. I, I'd kind of like to stay on. Then there was an option, what they called becoming a bond slave, where the master would take you to the doorpost of the, uh, of the house and he would drive an awl into the ear and pierce the ear and he would put a gold hoop in that, in that servant's ear and he would say, you think earrings are a new thing, sorry, they've been around. But he would put a gold hoop in that ear and that that 
hoop represented that this person is now a slave on my property, but not because they owe me anything. Because they, ch they choose to be here of their own free will. They, they willingly serve the master here on this property because, well, they recognize, hey, I'm doing pretty good with this master. And this is what Paul opens up all his letters with. Paul, a bond slave of Christ Jesus. I know who the good master is. And I choose to be his servant. But when you choose to serve someone and they are the master and the master says, go do this. What's the answer to the master? Yes, sir. I mean, if you weren't raised in a military family like I was, when we were told to do something, it was like, you do this. And we went, yes, sir. And they said, jump. And we said, how high? You know, whatever it was we were told to do, we, we didn't go, I don't feel like it. Or I don't think I want to. That wasn't even, in my thinking, I guess when I came to Christ, I just thought, if you have to do that in the military, <laughs> when you're told to do something by the, by the authority, if Christ is our authority and he says do something, what am I supposed to do? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Whatever you say, Lord. Yes, Lord. I do what you say to do. And so the Lord told me, go there. I'm like, okay. Honey, I, I feel the Lord's telling me to go to Hawaii, which we're married, so guess what? <laughs> You're coming too. And this is going to lead into today's sermon because, you know, Paul has just said our bodies last week in the end of chapter 6, our bodies are a temple for what? The Holy Spirit. And he said, our bodies are not for immorality. Remember, he's writing to a church where there's a lot of immorality around them. He says, our bodies are not for immorality. Our bodies are for the Lord. And so I tried to end last week's sermon with reminding you, your body belongs to the Lord. Right? Amen? Our bodies are the Lord's. Do you take your body and say, here, here I am, Lord. Like the scripture says, present yourself to God, a living and holy sacrifice, which is which is a acceptable spiritual service of worship. By the way, this is one of the first things I teach anyone who wants to be on our worship team. Say, so, oh, I want to do, uh, Pastor, I want to be up front with you on the worship team. Really? Okay. Do you understand what worship 101 is according to the scripture? You know, the scripture says, present yourselves alive to God. Just say, good morning, Lord, here I am. I present myself to you. You're, now, you're the master. You're the boss. You, whatever you need me to do, my body's yours. And if you want to be on the worship team and you don't want to go to God and say, here I am, use me, you can't be on the worship team. Sorry. It's not going to work. Because worship begins with the simple act of saying, here I am, Lord. I am yours. Do whatever you want to do with me. I, my body belongs to you. You paid for me. I'm yours. Now we come to chapter 7 of 1 Corinthians where Paul is going to go on to talk about this relationship of us to the Lord being, you know, we're presenting ourselves living to God. And they wrote to Paul some questions about, obviously about marriage and, and you know, how to interact with the opposite sex and some things that, the only reason I say this is because look at verse 1 of chapter 7. It starts with saying this, it says, now concerning the things about which you wrote me. He said, it is not good for a man to touch a woman. But because of immoralities, let each man have his own wife and each woman have her own husband. So they must have asked him something about, you know, touching a woman and, and you know, those things. What is that allowed? What is that, you know, what, what, what's what's permissible what's not and he goes look as far as immorality he says just let each man have his own wife and each woman have her own husband and and he's going to go on he's going to describe something in this relationship now paul paul seems to explain things about marriage that if you're not if you're not a student of the scripture you might not know this but paul had a title before he was called Paul, he used to be called Saul of Tarsus. And he had this title, Pharisee of Pharisees. In the Hebrew culture, he was schooled under Gamaliel. He was 
one of the really top, in fact, he said he was one of the, the top students of what we would consider of that day the premier rabbi. He excelled past all his contemporaries. But to get the title Pharisee of Pharisees, according to their culture, you actually had to be married. Which brings a big question, because Paul's going to talk in this chapter about if you can receive it, you ought to remain single as I am, so that you don't really have to have your attention divided between, you know, presenting your body to God every day as, here I am to serve you, Lord, as compared to the married man who, what's, who's his body belong to? Some of you already know this. And you cheated, right? You read ahead. In this chapter, Paul's going to say, if you're married, your body does not belong to you, buddy. It belongs to your wife. Okay, and, and vice versa. For the gals, your body no longer belongs to you. It belongs to your husband. And Paul's going to explain some intimate details of the relationship between husband and wife that some people go like, how could this single guy know about this stuff? I said, I don't think he was always single. I submit to you, he was probably married. And as we're going to see here, he's going to also describe if the believer has an unbelieving spouse, an unbelieving spouse doesn't want to stay with them, what's the answer? Let them go. But if they're willing to stay, oh, well, I'll read it to you, but I'm, I'm kind of giving you a little heads up on what's coming up. Because the only way Paul could have known all this stuff, I believe, is probably because he had a wife. And when he was radically converted, she went, you're a cuckoo. I'm not in the game with you no more. You used to be, you know, okay when you were killing them Christians, but now you're one of them. And I, I, and, and I don't have this, I cannot prove this from any text, like directly. So if you get to heaven and go, Izzy said, who is Paul's wife? I'm just, by, the only reason I can say, I, I'm just saying from the evidence of the, of the insights that this man shares, he had, e either God just gave him super insight, or he had to deal with a lot of questions that people ask, like, what about if I'm a believer and my spouse is not a believer? Should, should I stay with them? Or, uh, or, you know, I mean, it says, what fellowship does light have with darkness? We, we're not really in the same spirit. You know, the realm is not connecting us. Let's read what Paul has to say to the church at Corinth because they, I am sure, asked him questions about these very things. And so he goes on to write. He says in verse 3, The husband must fulfill his duty to his wife, and likewise also the wife to her husband. And the wife, he says, does not have authority over her body, but the husband does. Now, I heard, I heard a lot of guys stop their preaching from this text right there. Like they're doing some great service for us men. Men, your wives have not the authority over their body. You do. I'm like, did you read the rest of the verse? Because what's the rest of the verse say? <coughs> and likewise, husbands, you do not have authority over your own body, but your wife does. You're no longer your own when you get married. Now, Paul goes on, he says, so stop depriving one another. He says, except, there's one exception. You guys know the exception for when, when, when you can deprive one another? By agreement. <laughs> Some of you are going, oh, wait, good, I can, I can tell them I don't want to be with them right now. Only if they agree. And only for a time, so that you may only do one thing. Anyone know what it is? Pray. You are only allowed to deprive yourself of your spouse's affection by agreement for a time. This is a time-limited thing, guys. This is not like indefinite, forever, perpetual. I know some of well, you know, we got married. We were kind of affectionate, but we don't do that anymore. Why? That's a danger. You know, that is a danger. Paul says... You need to only do this for a time, a period, a short period, 
and he adds in so that you can devote yourself to prayer and then this is how I'm pretty sure he was married and then you need to come together again lest he says so Satan will not tempt you because of your lack of self-control you got to you got to get back together right after you had time to pray it's it's by the way is this a good good wisdom for protection for us it, it, you know it, Paul is actually looking out for the couples you guys might not realize but the very first command from God in the Bible to mankind anyone know what it is in Genesis by the way it's in Genesis 1 just so you not to make it tricky or anything. The very first chapter of the very first book of the Bible. Would you turn there with me? Let me just show you the very first commandment from God to men. Could, uh, anyone think what what, what what could it be? What, what was God's first command? He makes man. He makes a woman from man. Puts Adam to sleep in chapter 2. You get all the details. Takes a rib, forms her, presents her. Says this, she, he says, this is woman from the Hebrew, taken from man. She's taken from me. She is now bone of my bone and what? Flesh of my flesh. She's part of me. She completes me. She's the part God made to complete me. Because God looked at man and said, it's not good for man to be alone. I will make a helpmate suitable. Suitable for him. So he takes from man a part, a rib, and forms from it a, a woman and says, here, she's your help. Now, guys don't like me to teach this because intrinsically if I say we need a helpmate, right? I mean, I, I didn't say it. Who said this? God said. It's not good for a man to be alone. He needs help. It, women already know this. They're like, amen, yes, pastor, preach it. Those guys need help. But, you know, honestly, it's the men who don't ex acknowledge this that have the worst marriages. I don't need any help. I don't need her to help me with nothing. What are you, an idiot? God says you need help. I'm pretty sure he knows more than you. Now, I hate to be blunt, but this is true. And if God created women to be your helpmate... She has a purpose ordained by God. And you're telling her, don't do your purpose. I don't need you. Well, why don't you just get out a revolver and start shooting off toes? It, it would be better for you, the feeling of that, than telling your wife, I don't need you to do your purpose made by God to help me because I don't need help. You're foolish. God made you, and did he know when he created man, men would need help? You, you think, well, you know, maybe he just messed up. I don't think so. You know why I say this? Because I read a little further. In the book of Ephesians, Paul says, there's a great mystery about marriage. This mystery is, is so great, it's about a greater truth. The, the relationship between a man and a woman is, is to shadow something greater in the heavens. What, what, what relationship does it shadow in the heavens? That we're told, husbands, love your wives as Christ loves the church. That's right. Christ loves his church as his bride. And that's the greater truth. By the way, if you, just, you ever struggle in your marriage, you're like, I just don't know how to do it. What should I do? You know, you come to that point and some, something comes up and you're just like, I don't know what to do, Lord. The answer is, how would Jesus treat his church? For us guys, it's easy. We just go, what would the Lord do? You know, we get the bracelet, what WWJD, what would Jesus do? Because if we would literally do what Jesus would do for our wives, we're golden. We, we are actually doing what we were commanded in Ephesians. Husbands, love your wives like... Christ loves the church. No trouble. And for the gals, it's a lot easier on them if you do that. Huh? For us men, we have to step up and do what Christ does for his bride, for our brides.
when the Lord says, you take care of your wife. You present her without spot or without wrinkle or any such thing. You don't ever say, and my wife burnt the toast. Or my wife did this wrong. Or she... Fi Never. I apologize if I ever did that, honey. Never to do that, ever, to present our brides in any way with, with flaw or... Because Jesus says he's going to present his bride, the church, no spot, no wrinkle, nor any such thing. Holy and blameless. Mahalo for joining us. If you'd like more information about us, go to our website, AmazingGraceKona.com, and click the link to follow us on Facebook. That's AmazingGraceKona.com. Mahalo and God bless.